Up next here on Washington Journal, we are joined by Congressman Dan Newhouse, who's a member of the uh, House Appropriations Committee. He is also a member of the U.S. China Competition member. He's represented Central Washington State for some five terms. Congressman Newhouse, thanks for being here on Washington Journal this morning. It's good to be with you, Brian. Good morning to you too. Let's start with the um, the spending side of thing and your work of things and your work on the Appropriations Committee. We saw a headline recently that uh, a collision course over government funding raises the fear of a shutdown. Can you give us a sense of where things are with the the 12 annual spending bills that have to pass the House and Senate uh, this year? Oh, absolutely, and um, I think that's the thing that's on most people's minds these days is the entire appropriations process. The good thing is, as of uh, uh, by the end of today, we should have at least 10 of the appropriation bills, 10 out of 12, uh, passed through the full committee. Um, and then uh, two more, I believe, will be next week. And so we will have all of that committee work done, ready to move bills to the floor of the House. Um, <clears throat> the Senate, uh, which has uh, also been doing a great job of moving bills forward, is, is, I think, on track to get uh, their work done in, in good order. So I'm feeling um, confident that if, if we can get the bills to the floor and pass, the Senate does the same, that we can meet in, in a, a conference setting to be able to come together between the two chambers and uh, provide the legislation for each body to consider uh, so that we can avoid um, either a continuing resolution or, or a shutdown. Oh. A, pr a press release from your office at the end of May and announced your vote in the fiscal supporting the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the agreement between um, um, House Republican leadership and the and the White House on spending levels. Tell us how that has affected um, your debates, your considerations in the appropriations process. Absolutely. Well, I think that underlies uh, one thing underlies the whole process, and that's the fact that we are currently at about a thirty two trillion dollar uh, a, a debt uh, that uh, everybody recognizes, at least on our side of the aisle, that that is an unsustainable position for the country to be in, that we have to uh, curb our spending. Uh, we have to be, be able to get a handle on our, our, our um, uh, spending versus our revenue and, and be able to reduce over time that debt. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's unfairly putting a huge burden on top of uh, our children, our grandchildren, the future generations of this country. Uh, particularly, we see that playing out with, as interest rates have been increasing. It, uh, interest on our national debt is becoming a huge part of our uh, spending. And so uh, it, it's unsustainable. And so that, that uh, under, uh, I think, is underneath all of the uh, conversations that we're having in our appropriations process. We are looking for ways to be able to do exactly that, curb that spending. And so that doesn't come without uh, some consternation and some debate and pushback. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we've been funding over the last several uh, 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 biennia have been things that people want. And people, uh, have, have, there have been positive things that we have been funding, but we just are on a, a course to, in order to be able to uh, curb that federal, federal spending. So well, that, that, that has been, I think uh, one of the biggest things that uh, I see is a positive thing of, of this appropriation process that we are we are actually for the first time in a long time positioned to spend less this fiscal year than last fiscal year. As you look at it though with that fiscal responsibility act uh, having in pass and that is the framework where do you see potential specific uh, sticking points in um, in the appropriations process? Potential sticking points in terms of agreement on on spending levels. Yeah. Um, well, there's been some some debate about what those spending levels should be, obviously, whether they are a floor or a ceiling. Um, w we have taken the position that uh, those agreements that were come to uh, in that legislation, we, we can still find more savings and we should. I think the American people are expecting us to be as uh, smart about our spending as possible to util utilize taxpayer dollars in the most efficient way, and we should continue to be uh, looking for ways that we can we can save. And so that's you know, I think that's going to be a continued part of this process as we move forward. Certainly, there's going to be collisions with that kind of approach, uh, not only with, with our friends across the aisle, but I'm assuming also with the Senate as they move forward 
they are taking a little bit different tact. And so that's, that's what this process is all about, being able to uh, put our two positions on the table and work out uh, uh, our differences and be able to move forward. Congressman uh, Dan Newhouse is our guest. We welcome your calls and comments at 202-748-8000. That's the Democrats' line. 202-748-8001 is the Republican line. And for independents and all others, it's 202-748-8002. You're also, Congressman, a member of the, the Select Committee on U.S. and China Competition. What has that committee been up to lately? What's been its focus? So let me just say that I'm, it's a huge honor to be part of this select committee to look at the challenges that we are facing from the Communist Chinese Party. Uh, it's a, uh, an area of huge, huge concern for people in this country to recognize. And, and I think, if I might just say, and I'll include myself in this, that uh, uh, most of us have been relatively ignorant uh, as, as to the uh, threat that China face, uh, proposes to this country. And so being able to be part of this committee to see firsthand from many of the expert witnesses that have provided testimony uh, on what's happening in this relationship that we have with, with, uh, with China and the Communist Ch uh, Chinese Party, um, it's been eye-opening. It truly has. And so we have been looking at, uh, in fact, just we had a hearing last week on the risks of doing business in, in China for American companies. Uh, we've been looking at some of the potential military, military threats that China poses, particularly as it, it, as it relates to uh, Taiwan and Southeast Asia, all of the countries on the Pacific Rim and, and and what that means to us as a nation, as well as the rest of the world. We're gonna be looking uh, tomorrow, in fact, we'll be having a hearing, uh, bringing in some of the officials from the Biden administration to really try to get a, uh, an, un an understanding of the strategy that the administration is working on and putting forward as it, as it relates to our relationship with China, whether militarily, economically, uh, many different ways. <clears throat> we. we we are in a, a position with this, um, with China. You know, we're the two largest economies in the world. Uh, we have our our economies are intertwined. We found during the pandemic that, um, in some areas, we are actually too reliant on China for some of the things that we need. So that was an eye-opening uh, uh, thing that we we have learned as part of our supply chain issues. We're learning some of the threats about the interest in, of China in uh, controlling m m many of the natural resources and, mm. and food production around the world. We're seeing that impact here in the United States as well. So there's a, a long list of things that I think uh, are, have been really important for us to, to look into and, and, and learn about and also share with the American people. And to your point about the, uh, the two largest economies, the levels of trade between the U.S. and China in 2022, imports and exports between the two countries totaling $691 billion. U.S. imports from China rose to $537 billion last year as Americans spent more on Chinese-made goods. And in that same period, the U.S. exports to China rose to $154 billion. I want to ask you, uh, Congressman, about a lead editorial in the New York Times this morning, headline that says that American, America can't build a green economy without China, pointing out that the U.S. cannot build a competitive renewable or electric vehicle industry from scratch and saying that the, that the country of China, the nation of China, is the world's number one manufacturer of electric vehicle batteries, for example. Yeah, and that's... Uh, we've, we've become dependent on them for many things. The, the lithium-ion batteries that go into electric vehicles is a great example. Some of the things for, uh, that are utilized in the um, solar electricity gener generation area also are uh, many of that. Many of those things originate from China. As I said, uh, one of the things that became obvious, very apparent during the pandemic was that we are becoming almost too dependent on 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 foreign sources for many of these materials, but particularly on the country of China. So uh, th that has led to uh, many of us c coming to the conclusion that we need to utilize uh, our own resources in this country uh, so that we can reduce our dependence on China for, for many of these things that uh, are important uh, to our economy and to our future. And so that's, uh, again, 
uh, one of the, the, the many important things and issues that we are uh, uncovering in this effort in this select committee. Does your committee look at all at the state of the diplomatic relations between the two nations? Or two nations? Well, that's that's one of the things that we'll be looking at, I think, in depth tomorrow uh, when we bring in the uh, some of the officials from the Biden administration to to talk about some of the uh, efforts that. Uh, are going on in, in this administration towards our relationship. You know, the interesting thing about China, and, and I think most people recognize this, uh, it's pro pro probably due to our forms of government, which are much different, but uh, they have a, a system that allows them uh, to look far into the future. They're, they're, they are, have strategies of 10, 20, 50, even 100 years where we, uh, uh, conversely, in this country, I think in much shorter time uh, segments, you know, whether it's to the next election, two years or four years from now. And, and that's proven to be a, a, a disadvantage to us because they're, they're truly uh, building a fast lane to accomplish their objectives where we're uh, at best at best are putting up guardrails to try to protect us as we bounce back and forth mm. in those lanes. It, it's, so that's something that I think we um, it would behoove us to try to think more long term, to be more strategic uh, in order to be, and we will have to do that in order to be successful um, competitively with China. All right, let's hear from callers. We'll go first to Sean in St. Petersburg, Florida. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. President, good morning, gentlemen. Um, to the subject, uh, I worked with the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, Colorado in the mid-1980s, and the federal government was actually working in opposition to them. But that is not the reason for my call this morning. Uh, the reason is, gentlemen, you have <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Representative Newhouse. You have Mr. Trump going around stating that he has a uh, right to the uh, information that he had stored in Mar-a-Lago. But my question is, do his attorneys actually know what the Presidential Records Act is? Are they telling him? Because it doesn't seem it's getting through to him. And if you have any knowledge on that, sir, I would appreciate it. A pleasant good morning, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the question. And I, I can't tell you what the president's attorneys know or, or don't know, I would think. You know, he has, uh, brings in a very high quality um, uh, representatives to to help him through his legal uh, battles and so I would assume that they have some knowledge of, of what it is you're speaking of but I I couldn't tell you one way or the other uh, whether or not that they have that information and whether they or if they do whether they share it with the president article from Washington State on the independent mm -hmm. line Mary hello there oh good morning good morning, good morning Mr. Good morning. Newhouse good morning Mary I was curious how are you doing good I was curious. I don't. I haven't. I've been staying away from the news because it was getting me too stressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I've been hearing. No, seriously, I'm not being smart. But um, I've been hearing so much, and I was wondering, Mr. Newhouse, because I know you're real popular here in Washington um, State. Um, are how? Are the Chinese buying a lot of our state, or is it just mostly in the plains or in the Midwest? And then, who do you think who do you think might become the president? I'm not the president, but the uh, governor, since Jay Inslee is going to be uh, moving on. Um, well, uh, well, thank you for that question, Mary, and good morning to you. Um, <clears> that <throat> there have been uh, some instances of of. Uh, Chinese purchases of farmland in uh, the state of Washington. Uh, it's similar to around the country. We have, you know, very, as you know, Mary, a, a very strong agricultural industry, which is attractive to a country like China, which uh, has a huge uh, task in front of it of providing enough food for its uh, uh, large population. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that the overall number of acres uh, that have been purchased by Chinese concerns in the United States it, it, as compared to the total number of farmland acres isn't huge. However, the, the trend that we're seeing over the last decade, uh, th those purchases have increased by a factor of 10. And it's not just agricultural land either. It's uh, property that could be situated near a 
uh, a military installation, infrastructure that is uh, important to, to national security. And so th this is a situation where we're, try we're trying to be proactive uh, so that we prevent what we see happening in other countries where China has been so aggressive in controlling natural resources of huge infrastructure projects, agricultural land uh, in countries, even in our own hemisphere. We don't want to wake up one day, uh, 10 years from now, and think, oh, we should have done something about this. We, we, want, to, we want to be proactive on this and, and stop it before it becomes a huge problem. And then <clears throat> you asked about um, our governor race in the state of Washington. Uh, I, I think that uh, after 12 years of Governor Inslee, the, the people of the state of Washington are looking for a new direction, obviously. The Democrats have been in control in our state. We haven't elected a Republican governor since 1980 in the state of Washington. I think that's the longest uh, of any state in the country that we've had a one party control. Uh, with the recent announcement of um, Dave Reichert uh, 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 running for governor, I think that uh, gives uh, Washingtonians a, a, a great alternative and a new direction uh, for our state, which I think would be very positive. Just adding on to Mary's question about China, a China Congressman Jenny from Chico, California asks you, what mm -hmm. threats does the Chinese Communist Party actually pose? Aren't we partners with them? Uh, as it relates to agricultural land, as do you think she's talking about? or Well, you kind of touched on that, but maybe she's <clears throat> referring particularly to, and we, we briefly looked at this, uh, military threats. Oh, well, oh wow. Well, <clears throat> that, that, that's an area where the Chinese have been particularly aggressive. Uh, they're... Uh, they have been uh, putting a tremendous amount of effort into building their military. I believe they have more naval ships than the United States does now. Their presence uh, throughout the Pacific Rim and, and the, the Arctic area, for instance, is uh, growing and, and uh, much more prevalent. Uh, the threats that they pose, particularly with Taiwan, um, as raising concerns from countries throughout the Pacific Rim. Um, and the, the rhetoric that we hear from China leads us to believe that this is something that they're seriously considering doing, is in invading Taiwan. So that's, that's a huge threat that um, uh, should, should concern all of us. Are we partners with China? We, we certainly are uh, business partners, like, like we talked about, the two largest economies in the world we do a lot of trading back and forth. They buy a lot of agricultural products from the United States. We certainly buy a lot of uh, consumer products uh, from China. But as, as we talked about before, what we have found over the last several years is that we have become too dependent on some of the things that we that we need, particularly in a national emergency situation, for instance, as we found out during the pandemic. And that 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 all ties together in, uh, for instance, in the issue of, of farmland being controlled by, uh, by China. We wanna make sure that they don't have a control over any link in the supply ch chain as it relates to our food supply. That, that could put us in a very vulnerable position if in fact they do take action, whether it's in the Taiwan Straits or other parts of the world. On to uh, Cleveland and uh, Cleveland, Ohio. We'll hear from Jasper on the Democrats line. <clears throat> Yes. Good morning to you. Good morning, Jasper. Okay. Uh, I just have a, a question about the uh, why people keep bringing up Russian collusion. Uh, when Trump met with two of uh, Putin's oligarchs in the Oval Office, they were by themselves. And then when uh, Trump met with Mr. Putin, I think it was Helsinki at the G7 meeting, they put everybody out and they spoke for a couple of hours by themselves. A lady reporter asked him, well, what did you and Mr. Putin talk about? He turned around and looked her in the face and said, oh, that's none of your business. Now, are you being in, uh, I don't know if you're a mega or I know what, but you should, do you know what they talked about or can you explain that? Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Jasper. Um, yeah, I think that was, that meeting you're referring to was, I believe, five years ago. Um, um, obviously, I wasn't in the room and I, the, just the reports that I've heard, I can't tell you uh, specifically what those conversations uh, were about. Um, 
Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure that I fall into either one of those categories, Rhino or MAGA, but uh, uh, I try to do the best I can to, to represent the people uh, in central Washington state. All right, next up is Steve on the Republican line in Freeland, Maryland. Hi, hi Steve. Morning. Yes, uh, here's my question. What did you expect to happen when the legislative branch outsourced, outsourced and offshored all our manufacturing in the United States of America? <clears throat> and in doing so, of course we became dependent and reliable on China for everything from our drug compounds to our yeah. mass. To, you, we can go down the list because and it amazes me that COVID's four years old, five years old. Uh, we're still behind the eight ball, and it's too late now is the problem. 20 years plus of outsourcing and offshoring our manufacturing base out of the country, of course we're going to be reliable and dependent upon China. Oh, uh, That's not even a question anymore. Now it's about decoupling from China. Well, you can't even do that. So China has us over a barrel. And I don't understand, when it ever comes to farmland or when it comes to uh, Cuba or when it comes to South America, whatever happened to the Monroe Doctrine where we're not supposed to have any communist parties in the territory of the Western Hemisphere? Could you explain that to me? Uh, so we are, we are, our grandchildren, I'm 60-some, I just have two grandchildren, all our kids are, and grandchildren are going to be the next set of Uyghurs for the Chinese party. You have a nice day, sir. Congressman, yeah. Congressman Newhouse. Yeah, thank you for those comments. And you're absolutely right. We have the policies in our country have uh, caused a lot of our, our manufacturing to, to move overseas. And we have made efforts over the last several years to to re bring those uh, those uh, businesses back onshore to make it more um, uh, 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 advantageous for companies to produce in the United States to be more cost competitive to provide some of the incentives to bring bring those investments back in the United States and we're starting to see that with the uncertainty in the Chinese uh, uh, the whole dynamic in China uh, uh, with the, the economy uh, it, that stated it's in in China I think that um, we're going to see more of that and we need to look at, at more ways that we can incentivize businesses to uh, do what they do in the United States of America. You're absolutely right. So many different things that we found we depend on uh, on China for. It shouldn't be a surprise. It's exactly, you know, the, the businesses responded exactly as we should have expected them to over the last couple of decades. And so we, we need to find more ways to uh, bring those jobs back to the United States, bring that manufacturing back to the United States and 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 be more self-reliant as it relates to whether it's all of the things that you mentioned, even our energy production. We have to be able to rely on those things that we can do best here in the United States so that we don't find ourselves in such a vulnerable uh, position in, in, the, in the future. Um, Congressman, I'm not sure that I'm not sure if uh, Benton City, Washington, is in your district. But it absolutely is. Susan from Benton City writes us and asks you this question: What's his plan for the fentanyl crisis plaguing uh, our communities? Uh, very good. Well, uh, absolutely, Benton City is in my district, just uh, maybe 30 miles from my home. So it's good to hear from you, Susan, and thank you for bringing up the fentanyl crisis. Uh, th this is something that is plaguing communities throughout the country, whether uh, large urban areas or small communities like Benton City. Uh, I've put together a, a, a fentanyl task force recently uh, that we're looking at, at we're, we're bringing together experts in different uh, aspects of this issue uh, from uh, treatment centers, from law enforcement to the judicial uh, uh, side of, of things from uh, organizations that are working hard to, to uh, keep young people from getting into uh, illicit drugs, uh, many different aspects of this. We're, we're even looking to bring in, uh, and this was at a suggestion of a, a caller at uh, one of the uh, radio programs that I was on recently, bringing in a recovering, a recovered addict from uh, drug abuse. And so we're trying to find all of these we we'll bring all these people together to try to find solutions that we that we can 
um, utilized to bring an end to this crisis that is plaguing so many communities. And, you know, uh, this is, like I said, this is a problem in central Washington state. I would say it's a problem throughout the country. And I'm hopeful that the work that we can do can be used, uh, solutions that we come up with can be used not only in our area, but throughout the country. And, and thank you for bringing that because one of the things I've been asking for is ideas from other people around the country. We don't want to reinvent any wheel here. Uh, we want to be able to take in a, a, a information and ideas from, from people all over the country. So what, what, is the, what is the best way if people have ideas that want to reach out to your office, uh, email address or phone number, which is the best way for folks to reach uh, your office, Congressman? Uh, we, we could uh, certainly provide uh, my, uh, my congressional website. That's available uh, for people to be able to contact me. I would, I would be happy to take those kinds of that kind of input. Dan Newhouse is Congressman, fifth term from uh, the 4th District in the state of Washington, Central Washington. Congressman, thanks for being on the program this morning. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, all that you do through C-SPAN to keep uh, the American public informed about what's happening uh, around the country. I appreciate that. Still to come here on Washington Journal, we'll open it up for your thoughts and comments on items in the news, things we've talked about already this morning, or other political or national news uh, items that you're